Uh, well, that was a big no. Uh, uh, just because I, uh, it's, I'm already on the phone, Revy, uh, are you by any chance um, free at uh, 425? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, no, that, oh, my God. I, I just realized. No, 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 never mind. It's too late. I, I totally forgot. Why? Totally what's forgot going into 425? Nothing. I, I just wanted to speak, but I'll, I should do it earlier in the day. I can do it another day. Send me an email. If I'm around and I'm up and I'm not busy with family and whatnot, I, I can do this. I mean, this is a great, uh, this Zoom toy is great for me. I mean, you have to, you have to appreciate, I'm, I'm totally clueless and I don't have WhatsApp and I don't have anything. So this is a, uh, it's, uh it's, free and easy it's amazing yeah. because okay. uh some of the Godoli Yisrael have all started using zoom and it's like interesting that you could see like Riv Landau on a zoom call like they schedule different things um and yeah 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 quite a new world order we're in right now yeah 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 <clears throat> Jacob Greenspan nice to see you Ezra Schwartz great to see you hi Rebbe how are you I'm great Baruch Hashem um it's still I I if all of you were to know each other, you would really enjoy each other. I mean, I don't know if this is exactly the venue for you to become close, fast friends, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'd like to get down to business as opposed to schmoozing. If anybody had something on their minds or anything, anything uh, juicy, good, random question, that's great. Otherwise, we'll go right into EO. Hi, Ben. Does this, does this format intimidate people into silence? Because I, I'm looking at people who are not known for their reticence ordinarily, but is it something about the Zoom or the size of the group or something that makes it no. less conducive to speaking? Rebbe, I think what it is, is that when we were in Yeshiva, we were all walking around. There was stuff to, you know, like different sites, inter different interactions. Then right. Some of you were actually flying questions. on the ceiling, if I recall correctly, yeah. Um, but <sighs> we've just been stuck at home, so like, it's not like, you know, new things don't come up as much. And I think that's why we haven't really had uh, a lack of uh, random you're questions. You're all just, you're, what you're saying essentially is you're all totally boring. Rebbe, I was wondering, what's the right Kavana to have when counting uh, Sphira? I'm reminded of, uh, it was another story from Michelle Salanter who somebody was uh, uh, gonna be blowing the shofar and was researching all the um, deeper Kabbalistic significance of each individual Tkia, Trua, Shvarim, and um, went to Rabbi Israel and asked him if he could advise him on the individual Kavanos for each blast. And Rabbi Israel advised him, he said, you should have, you should be in good voice and try to, try to be mostly the community, their obligation. You know, so I mean, by which I think what he's conveying, and maybe it's a parallel answer here, is that um, we should have kavana be makayim mitzvasase, as as they say, right? Um, and and uh, that we're counting down towards our Sinai, and we're building anticipation, and how thrilling! I mean, you can go fancier than that, but I, I like the path. Hi, Ari Swift. I like the path of least resistance on these things. You know, um, have kavana. Think about the magnitude. Um, Think about Claudius counting all around the world and through all history. That's pretty inspiring. And of course, you know, it's a mitzvah that, well, what do you know? It's in this week's parsha. Okay. With that, with that again, barring any anything else, we will go back into Eov. Um, we talked last night about the, oh, we talked about the friends, we talked about the concept of friendship. Uh, I can't resist, I have to say it. Who knows what's coming out of my mouth right now? Maybe maybe you were shocked I didn't say it at all last night. If anybody happened to be in any of my shirim, uh, oh, that's a, any well, point, Is it that Rambam? Rambam, Perik, Dalid, Halakha, Aleph, and Dek. Right? Very good. Yeah. Right. In other words, Perk, wow. right. Anybody doesn't right, well, remember what this is talking about, Yudarath, you aren't you aren't necessarily with me as much as some other people here, but um, there is a Rambam, and it's quotable and memorable and uh, words to live by that we're defined by our friends, we're defined by our surroundings, and so if we're wise, uh, I, I've only felt I mean as much as I drill this one in to the point of um, ad nauseum, but uh, 
but it's just so true. And I feel it's, I feel it more passionately now than I've ever felt it, that um, I'm looking at looking at where people go in life. Um, understanding that uh, these are, um, it's terribly important that we surround ourselves with the right people. And um, even his friends, apparently they were doing exactly that. And so this issue is very striking. And like so many of the other issues that Eov raises, I don't have, um, I don't have complete clarity. I don't have all the answers. I evidently neither did the Mepharshim. Uh, there are more questions unanswered in Eov than there are answered, although there are some that are answered and hopefully we'll get those too. But, um, but this discrepancy between, you know, the model friends as they're presented, uh, anybody wants to know a good friend, as we learned last night, Rabbi says, look at Eov and his friends, the fine circle. And, uh, you know, how they were on such the same wavelength, one would experience suffering and immediately all of them knew whether that's meant to be literally a crown on their heads or whether it was like an intuitive sense that they, that they had somehow that somebody's in trouble right now and let's, let's go and help them as they enter the gate at the same time. But there's such a discrepancy between that model, which is brought to us purely in Chazal, and then, of course, what, you, what we're about to read in the text, which uh, doesn't do them any favors. So to consider that a little bit more deeply, and uh, hi, Dovi. Hello. To consider that a little bit more carefully, uh, <clears throat> a couple comments. They <clears throat> are going to be, um, they're going to be bouncing around the idea of theodicy, which we've defined in broad terms as uh, trying to understand justice in the world why sometimes it appears that bad things happen to decent people and the converse that does, uh, uh, the, um, the wicked seem to prosper. Alternately, in a related but not identical idea, why does, why does Hashem's justice seem to be meted out in ways that don't follow a pattern that come across to us at least as random, but that's our finite perception sometimes. And Yehov um, is going to embody a few different views, uh, talk about character development. I mean, he's certainly going to go through a lot of different phases, um, almost like a teenage, teenager in angst. Lots of um, Rebbe, can you hear us? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, anybody else getting that? I think I, everyone's getting yeah, it. Yeah, I think we're getting it. One second. It's been taken over by the robots. <laughs> the revolution has started. Whoever said that, I respect you. Oh, it's just me, the cheese bowls guys. Oh my God, Elio! Do you remember, the, Elio? Do you remember that time during our perm spiel where <laughs> Rebbe was a robot and he froze? Uh, I was literally just thinking that. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, That's a good perm uh, spiel. You guys. Actually, Alex Friedman is secretly controlling me in the other room. Oh, yeah, it, yeah. It's on YouTube still. Yes. <clears throat> is it on YouTube still? It is on. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it did come out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ezra, Ezra Schwartz, yours, yours is fairly immortal as well. These superheroes. Rabbi, we're just giving heads up. Yes, the, uh, uh, I did a great job of taking all the credit for them. <laughs> well, I'm deserving of uh, Rabbi Lawa, is someone doing something bad? Is someone doing bad things to your internet connection? In the because none of us can hear you very well. Also quite uh, yeah, Rabbi, with the internet connection is kind of getting like very distorted. So, like, we'll pass it's, we my, it's my fault. So, yeah, it's very cool. Um, as the other night, I apologize for lack of professionalism. Let me go see. We have a house full of uh, really cute kids, but uh, let me go. I'll be back. Did you guys know that cute kids fix internet issues? I think we call those millennials. <laughs> Oh, I miss Derek so much. By the way, a quick question for everyone here. Is everyone in the WhatsApp group or no? 
So no, just, actually. All right, so I'm going to yeah. send the link to the WhatsApp group. We post the share oh, and a reminder every day to like come to share. Awesome. Okay. Ezra, are you going back to Tomo next year? This has been a fun yeah, time. That no. was probably it. Apologies <laughs> no. for the uh, problem. Is, are we okay now? Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, can somebody tell me what you last recall so we can get back on track? Um, the last thing I have down yeah, is that EO is going through different phases before it got like very like broken up. Wow. Okay. So let's, 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 sorry about this and let's, let's get back on track. So EO, um, the, they are expressing different views of suffering in the world and EO will go through many different phases. Um, you got the petulant teenager. No. Okay. So he tries on different personalities. Like we find with teenagers who go through different phases. Uh, and that, that will be evident. But there does seem to be, uh, EO does seem to be indicating on some level when he asks, why me? And what have I done to deserve it? He's um, sort of asking it as a rhetorical question. In other words, I don't think I've really done anything to deserve this, is what he's really saying. Um, what does that mean? And does that border on some kind of a heretical idea? You know, Because if I haven't done anything to deserve this, then maybe this is unjust, is what's possibly insinuated and we'll consider that but the friends are coming in a sense from another attitude um, that uh, they're, they're, they're understanding that actually all suffering is quite deliberately for a purpose and implying not so subtly that if you've uh, if you're in a if you're in a mess EO well you know evidently you must deserve it on some level now uh, if the text kind of makes them appeal, appear sort of foolish, and yet Eov's ideas are certainly not the best attitudes for suffering, how do we understand this? Um, it seems that we're going to have to hear the friend's words with a little bit more um, understanding and, and give them a more sustained reading. The, they're they're going to have they're going to be saying things that are going to be a lot deeper that we're going to than we're going to see on the surface. Um, it may be. As much as we said last night, they are the prototypes of Onus Dvarim, which is a uh, Nisra Diaraisa, the Torah prohibition of saying something that makes somebody feel bad, and do they ever. But it may also be that their uh, motivation, L'shem Shemaim, might have been to um, push him to a certain greatness, meaning by challenging him. Of course, the ideal response on his part would have been to reconsider his ways, perhaps maybe even make tshuva. And uh, there's, in other words, a big subtext in all of this that's, come, that's, that's unfolding. Let's finish the second chapter together. If you could take out your books, um, otherwise I'll, I'll do it for you. Uh, hi, Aviel. Who else has come? Anybody yeah, in the I'm meantime? Fine. No. Okay, great. Take out, take out every EO. We are holding by... Well, let's go back a little bit. Remember that the friends came from different gates. We're introduced. We have three of them. These are not the only friends that we're going to meet, but these are three primary friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sofar. They don't recognize him, we said. They wept. We didn't comment on that. What do you suppose that must have felt like to Eov? You know, they weep. They tear their clothes. They, um, and actually, it's not just weeping. They broke into loud weeping. Each one tore his garment. They threw dust into the air over their heads. It's like, let's say, um, you know, you just went through terrible reconstructive surgery and people, your friends walk in and have that kind of reaction to you. You say, oh, 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 you know, what did I do? What, what, what? Right? I mean, I, that, that can't be exactly comforting either. And then, of course, famously and correctly, they sit with him in Pasuk 13 on the ground. We're in the second chapter. They sit with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. None spoke a word to him, for they saw that the pain was very great. And for anybody who doesn't recall, what is his pain? His pain is spiritual, emotional, and quite physical now, right? No wealth, no livestock, no children, and now grievous, grievous, uh, ongoing pain, inescapable pain. And now Pasuk 14, 
Let's do it in Hebrew. Achrechein posach iov es pihu vayikalel es yomo. Afterward, Eov began to speak and cursed his day. I deliberately, if anybody has the R scroll, I deliberately changed from what the R scroll's translation. They're smarter than me, but I took my own license and translated it the way I think is best suited. Um, what do you make of that? Lashon is vayan, which is that the root of like answering, like a nene? We, we, it, you're, you're in you Dalit? Uh, wait. Uh, oh, my my. Uh, uh, the Safaria version is different. It doesn't have a you Dalit. It goes uh, after um, you Gimel, so it starts the new parak for some reason. Uh, Vayan is the first parak. First pasuk. We'll go to the previous pasuk. Acharechein pasach Yovetzpio. You see that the kavalis yomo. Well, what does that mean? Right. Well, okay. Well, what do you make of this is my question. Again, the translation is afterwards, Eov began to speak and cursed his day. First of all, after what? Pointedly, and it says it at really juicy times in, in, in throughout Tanakh, afterwards, and you're not always sure what the afterwards is going on, right? It, it's, it's the phrase that, can, um, that begins the passage of the Akedah, and we find it at various junctures throughout the Tanakh. Uh, so what would you make of the afterwards? Clearly it's meant to connect this with something previous. Uh, after his friends. Sorry, what? After their friend, after his friends, basically just. Good. Okay, so you have to go, you know, you have to go with a simple reading, first of all. Of course, you know, we're talking about a sequence. Um, and so the friends are there, they're silent, they, mm -hmm. they, 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 do, they, they do whatever they do, and then afterwards is what he responds to. The problem with that interpretation, as simple and straightforward as it is, and it's correct, obviously, to always try the simplest path first, the problem with that is that it's redundant. Meaning, um, if, I, if you have a sequence of psukim, and uh, they don't say anything, and the pain is very great, um, you could just launch the next pasuk by saying, Pasach io ves piu vi kalas yomo, I don't need to know afterwards, because evidently, if the Pusik follows, it is afterwards. In which case, what might be the purpose of writing afterwards? Because of, because of his friends? Somebody might be singing in the background. I don't know. I, it's impossible to identify who, but if uh, maybe somebody's audio. Yeah. Say it again. Because of his friends coming into, because of what his friends did, I guess? Maybe. So you're saying you're saying it's through, it's it's meant to show Eob's reaction to his friends. To his friends, yeah. And at this point, I, I'd probably given you too much in advance about what's what's coming up ahead. At this point, the friends have not done anything that is maybe grossly inappropriate. Maybe their reaction is a little bit uh, uh, dramatic, almost like thespians, you know, like oh no, you know, kind of like an extreme reaction, but um, doesn't seem to warrant whatever Eel's response is. And, and what do you make of Eel's response? What is this? He opened up his mouth and he cursed his day. The way the puzzle makes it sound is that it, everything that Eel's thought it's like, just comes out all at once. Like he's held back, he's held back. And then all of a sudden, you know, Pesach Eel of it's all coming out now. I don't know very much coming out at all. I just hear something very, very, something very specific. Meaning, I, I think we're in store for an avalanche of emotions that's coming. But right now, quite the contrary, the way I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm taking you on a little bit here. The way I see it is, um, he's actually um, speaking maybe um, less guardedly. And certainly, this is not the EO that we met at the end of the first chapter, who says all the right things. Now, something feels inappropriate here, but what is it exactly? And it's quite, um, as we say, it's, it's restrained. It's, it's, it's uh, very specific. As if he wants to do what you're describing, Eitan, but even then is holding himself back. Hi, Shammai. Hey, Rabbi. Uh, if, I, if I may say something. 
Great, um, please do. Yeah, it seems like the, the phrasing, he cursed his day. Uh, I've been just like thinking about it for a while. It seems he's questioning his existence, like why he was even born. Excellent. Maybe that's that's what that's mean. that means, at yeah. least most simply. That's a state that human beings get to, especially confronted with extreme suffering. Meaning, I don't know if there's any anything theological to be read into it. And uh, whatever's going on, whatever's roiling beneath the surface, that all well meet, that all well meet may may come out. But on some almost primal level, there's a sense of, is all this worth it? I mean, the pain is so intense. What am I doing here? Somebody's gonna say. Isn't that what the Ramban said? What are you What are you thinking of? No, it's there's commentary down here. Um, so we get, share with us. It's in the art score in this. Excellent. Please read it, Ben. Um, what's it called? A, and and cursed his day. Um, what's it called? This Eel- is Ramban Nachmanides. Yeah, yeah, Ramban. Excellent. Let's hear. Let's hear the Ramban. Um, and cursed his days. Um, you saw that his he was permitted. He was being punished with terrible suffering despite his total in- innocence. Rather than attribute, um, rather than attribute a lack of justice to um, God himself, um, you have con- conject- conjectured um, the man's fate is not controlled by God at all, but that he permits um, events to be predetermined by the stars and constellations. Therefore, he's... Oh, cur- that's, it's not just the Ramban. It's going to be a, a, a several different Mepharshim, but certainly that's one approach. And I think you're actually saying more than what I was getting at right now. And I, I was going to go there too at one point, but excellent. Anything more that, that he adds? And he just says, that, that, um, therefore, he cursed the day he was born. That was it. Right. I mean, that already, that reading already is getting the, into theology and making some kind of a statement about Hashem's involvement or lack of involvement in our in, in the goings on in this world i'm i'm saying on a simpler reading uh one could say sim- that, that um eo is reacting sort of modestly and just uh wondering what am i doing here uh another pasuk that comes to mind lahav deal it's a big tzedekis but a, a sentiment that's expressed um when Rifki Menu extreme experiences what apparently was an ordeal of a pregnancy uh, with those with the twins. So she says, Im Kane Lama Ze Anochi. It's not in my notes. I'm just I'm also brainstorming as we go a bit. She says, Im Ken Lama Ze Anochi. She says, if I have to endure this kind of pain, what am I even doing here? From the simple reading again, and there, there are as well, there are many commentaries that explain what she's really asking, uh, which is, but, but on some level of, uh, am I up to this? Am I equal to this? You hear people now, I don't know if you have, but people who've endured the uh, coronavirus uh, in the, sometimes in, in sometimes the really horrific instances, describe it like this, of uh, a, a, an ordeal that they um, are, it, it uh, throws them out of their um, comfort zone because it's, there's something about it that's so uh, unpredictable, something that, that uh, when maybe we go through other diseases, we expect perhaps a hard period followed by some respite. You get a fever, you break the fever, you come down again. Um, often you hear descriptions of people with coronavirus who just when they think they're getting better, suddenly out of nowhere, it gets dramatically worse. And some people who are on the way to recovery suddenly die is one narrative. In which case the uh, slings and arrows, not to get all Shakespearean here, but the, 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 the sense that uh, I, I don't know what's coming next. And if it's worse than what I've already dealt with, I'm not sure I'm up to it. Chazal tell us that, and we, we mentioned this in one of the earlier sessions, because I'll tell us that everything that we get, we can handle. And that there's no, no such thing as something that a person is not equipped with, that somebody's not qualified to rise to. And so evidently, whatever we're, we're dealt, um, we have the resources, we have the skills to do it. 
Uh, we're going to talk more in depth, I think, on Sunday already about the concept of Nisayon, what is really a trial. But this is a premise that we, that we share that uh, we're all equal to it. Problem is, of course, from our finite perception, um, sometimes we, we hear that idea and we do a double take and we think, yeah, I I'm capable of managing this. I mean, this is superhuman. People's ordeals. You hear people's service in life too, that sometimes it's hard to bear. You know, you know the term secondary trauma? I refer to it sometimes, therapists describe it frequently. If you're a therapist who still retains humanity, I realize that's not always the case with therapist, but if you're a therapist who has a feeling for people and maybe even some empathy left, uh, I haven't gotten numb from all the uh, experiences in the therapy room, um, so then, you know, if your client, and I guess you do the kind of work that I, I did for a while, which is working with people in the field of domestic violence, where you hear truly horrific kinds of real life stories. So of course the client endures whatever suffering they go through. And again, as a human being, you come to identify and even like and empathize with your clients. So you experience a similar kind of a trauma. That's the secondary trauma. And uh, you have a sense, sometimes you hear people's service and it's overwhelming. Here are a couple of comments. Ben, I appreciate your, your, uh, your, what you added to discussion. Um, I would wish that uh, I'd, I'd invite all of you to take out a good, you know, good safer EO with comments and enrich our discussion like Ben did. Uh, so there is a comment that um, after this, connecting it back to the friends, um, there's a comment in the Das Mikra that the, for the seven days, the friends, of course, as we've said, were, were correct to maintain their silence. And uh, maybe, in fact, their correct, proper, upright behavior in the beginning is why, in the first place, Rav in the Gemara understands that they're the model friends. But then, if you, if you look carefully at the sequence, no one speaks a word. Silence, silence, and more silence. And perhaps that's the afterward. This is maybe what I was suggesting before and trying to figure out what is afterwards. After what? After nothing. Something. And um, their failure to speak, even when the Shiva is formally over, the seven days are over, and then you can speak, uh, maybe EO perceived as some kind of a betrayal on their parts. Have you been uh, recently or ever? Have you have you been Menachem Avil? Have you have you visited somebody in Shiva? Mm -hmm. Does anybody else other than me find it uh, sometimes a very awkward uh, situation? Obviously, well, it's meant to be like that. Well, no, not always. I mean, I I mean to be fair, I, I've been to some shivas that I know it's going to sound weird, but I, I've been to some shiva houses where it's um, poignant and touching and uh, powerful. And beautiful sometimes, right. depending how people are and maybe the nature of the relationship. I've been to weddings that are, I've been to funerals that are beautiful in the way people speak about their love or their admiration for the uh, for the deceased. I think and the hardest part, like some, I like you know, there are other times where you just go in and you don't know what to do. Or no, say. The hardest part, you're not you're not you're not allowed to greet. You can't go to greet. <laughs> that's just the hardest part you know you can't so say hi you know you. i'm with you 100 percent. it's so against our social training exactly yeah i'm right I'm right I'm, it's, it's it's built in awkwardness i'm right, reminded exactly. of i'm reminded of rebby's story of uh how someone walked in uh and tried to make a joke and the person didn't laugh right, i told it yesterday here oh. all right all right <laughs> it's not a joke it's i mean that was a true story right, right. that was uh it's an old friend of mine Right, right. So there is something awkward, and so you could, and I don't know, anybody imagine going to me, Menachem Eov, after loss, after loss, after loss, what do you say? I mean, it's possible to defend them. Maybe there were no words, and you're just groping for something appropriate. How was lunch? I don't know, something, right? But still, you know, words are what we have. And so one way we, we, we reach out to one another. So you may have felt the sense of betrayal. And I'm going to jump ahead. You don't have to, I mean, you can look at it if you want, but I'm going to refer to a Pusik that's coming much later. It's in the 19th chapter, Pusik 21. 
Eov says, Hanuni, Hanuni, Atem Re'ai. He says, pity me, pity me, my friends. By which he's, I mean, there he gives away at least some of his inner thinking. Um, he, he deeply, desperately needs them. Hold my hand, be there for me, have pity, have compassion. He craves something from them. And um, already by the 19th chapter, right? That's many chapters into a longish book. We're not going to be going in the same depth consistently. We'll, we'll be doing this rather quickly um, coming up. But uh, if you, you know, it takes 19 chapters for Eov to reach out to them and say, you know, a word of compassion is something. Evidently, they were not really providing that. And uh, from their perspective, I mean, again, remember their outright shock. I mean, they're, they're, they're facing what seems to be an unrecognizable, I mean, they, they don't recognize him, broken man who, among other qualities, probably, um, probably he, he, he just, he smelled rancid, right? I mean, a few, few, uh, few things that are harder to bear than a, than a, than a putrid stench. And it's entirely plausible on their part that the stench on the outside was maybe somehow reflecting something putrid on the inside. And so Vaikalo es Yomo, perhaps in the, with the specter, with it, confronting all of these realities and friends who he's wondering if he could still even count his friends in his, in his, uh, in his newfound state, Eo finds himself perhaps here utterly alone. He has no children. He has a wife who doesn't understand him and in many ways represents his ideological opposite. He's confounded by the events and probably the supernatural speed that they afflict him. Uh, these are not just ordinary tragedies. There are events that scream hashkach pratis, but in not, the, not in the direction that we, we daven for. Hashkach pratis is divine providence, that Hashem is involved in our lives. Well, I mean, this is almost miraculous tragedy. Everywhere he looks. So Hashem is somehow conveying something. And then the deep, deep mystery and suffering inherent by our cluelessness of it all. He's confounded. Right? There's no obvious divine meaning. What, what is this all about? And what did I do exactly? And now his friends are here and his presence, which of course the whole purpose of going to pay a visit and be there for people is, is, is to comfort, is to say, well, you know, there are no words, but take my hand. And maybe there's silence on some level mocks him. And all that remains as he, he, he stares into a dark chasm of emptiness. And maybe that, I mean, you quoted the Ramban, the Malbim says something very similar, Ben, to what you, you'd said, but Malbim says it differently. He had before, and they're Medayik, the, he, Malbim had built a whole argument about this, that um, Eov was somebody who subscribed to the Mazalos. I should explain what that means. We talked about it, and many of us have learned this in depth. Uh, one of my favorite Gemaras, the Shabbos and Kufnun Vav Amid Aleph and Base at the end of the Masechta, talks about um, the constellations, and when people are born, somehow that corresponds to a certain innate quality that becomes evident in the person. Uh, some, sometimes it it's correlates to the day or sometimes to the month. And... The conclusion of the Gemara, even though there's some debate there, is that the non-Jews are indeed um, assigned mazalos. There are some kind of stars and constellations that will determine a certain amount of their fate. Uh, Jews, there's one opinion that we're in the same boat, but that's rejected by the majority. The majority say, Ein Mazel Yisrael, from perhaps the perspective that Yehov was not Jewish. So then um, he's on a roller coaster. Uh, that's being guide, guided by an unseen operator who's taking him in directions that he cannot fathom. And he assumes that all of this has to do with the fact that he was born. Because of course, the mazel, just like today in astrology, all goes back to that uh, primordial day and its significance in the universe. 
he cursed his day. Why that day? Why that astrological fortune cookie? Notice here too, and Eitan, this is why I was resisting where you were going with this. We don't see any outright um, apostasy, heresy. He doesn't curse Hashem. He just, on some kind of almost pathetic, uh, meager note, he just wishes that he didn't have to come into what now seems to be a very lonely, bleak existence. Regardless, this is not the same Eov we, uh, we saw in the last, in the last chapter. Um, this is heavy stuff, very profound, and uh, it's the kind of material that, if you're hearing it for the first time in your life right now, it's something that's worth revisiting. With, other, with, with further commentaries. You can tell there's, we're just introducing it here, uh, but there's much depth in all of this and much that's meant to resonate with us. I mean, I think even if we're gonna be groping for answers and maybe some of, we'll find some answers and some resolution to many others, we may, we may get even more confused, but there is a meta message in the fact that all of these thoughts and feelings are experienced by Eov, and so sort of by extension, since Eov, we've said already, might be every man. If he's a parable, well, maybe he's me and you. And so the sense that in the Tanakh itself, and especially if this is authored by Moshe, no less, that it's almost like the Tanakh and Hashem is saying, I feel your pain. I know what you're going through. Sometimes by just giving it a name, by describing an experience, when you hear somebody else has a story and you have a vicarious identification with that story, it's, oh, right, yeah, I, I completely feel that. I know exactly what you've been through. And just that empathy, that sense of, I'm not alone in all this, right? So we read Eo's story and somehow maybe we also feel that sense of, oh, maybe I have it okay, actually. Maybe I'm not so, 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 so badly off, as it turns out. That's in itself a very powerful message. Shall we start the third pair? Anybody have reflections? Questions? Okay. I guess third I have a pair. question of why. Is there like a machlokas on where the third pair ends? I mean, um, do like the Christians end in one area and then like the Jews end in a different area? Well, Safaria, I don't know it at all. I, I glanced at it briefly because I somebody somebody has sent me something I had to reference, but um Safari is based on the Koran, isn't it? The Koran. The Koran which like... Tanakh, which Tanakh are they drawing from? Safari just takes previously published books, no? Um, yeah, but they're, I guess so. I don't know which uh, rendition. So I think, if my impression is, is that the, the version, they're not using the Arsenal, they're using the Koran. Uh, they're actually, the they're using takes... worse. They're using the yeah. Koran, really? No, no. <laughs> I thought that was a Jewish website. Yeah, I don't this know why is I where this that. gets dangerous. Uh, Shammai, now I'm going to be up on YouTube and I'm going to be in big trouble. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, the Quran is president. a different work by it for a different religion, not ours. Um, Koran is the name of a publishing house that's, I think, I think I can say this reasonably. Oh, I think it's, 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 oh, uh, okay, fine, okay, fine, okay, fine. Not the Koran. K O R E N, usually spelled. And it's, it's people who are scholarly they're in the world of academia, and they also identify usually as modern Orthodox, uh, if that means anything. And um, it is Jewish. They okay, sometimes draw, sometimes their works are, they compare and may use other texts. Our scroll is careful to make sure that their version of the text uh, tries to keep consistent with um, Jewish tradition. I mean, you sh I mean, I, I'm sorry, I should really say something even more fundamental, but I'm assuming that I shouldn't, but I shouldn't assume. Um, Remember that the chapter and verse is not a Jewish invention, it's a Christian invention. Right. So there's nothing really sacrosanct or important about the fact that we've now, that I've called this chapter 2, plus uh, 14, that could be otherwise. I mean, I think this is well placed here, frankly. And probably that's why our school puts it here. But the fact that there's the inconsistency, okay. I mean, that's not, uh, that's not something that, that Chazal would be medayek. All right. Uh, Art Scroll Chapter 3, Pasuk Aleph, um, uh, Safaria Chapter, what is it, Chapter 2 still? No, Chapter uh, chapter 3, uh, yeah, Chapter 2, Pasuk, or... I guess 15. 
Oh, no, no. So here, no, here's the new parak. So here, it's just 3, 2 instead of 3, 1. Fine, here we go. Vayan Eov Vayomar. Eov answered, in our school they say, declaimed, saying, Yovad Yom Ivalidbo, Valaila Amar Hora Gover. Oh, that the day upon which I was to be born might never have been. Nor the night fallen in which it was said a man was sired. Sired, fancy word for somebody gave birth to him. Okay, well, right now, at least, we're being much more, it's not just cursing the day, but he's really going into it and elaborate. And if there was any subtlety or any, any, uh, any kind of um, confusion about whether, what does Eov think about being alive? Uh, this is not a time to bring him a birthday cake. He would not be celebrating any birthdays anytime quickly, since he's not particularly happy with his plight of even seemingly walking on this planet. Uh, <clears throat> Eov's theology and his view seems to change right now. The Ramban Ben was referring to says as much. Um, he can't conceive, I'm going to reinforce the idea, he can't conceive since God is all good, he's benign, but then how could there be injustice in the world? We pose this in the at the end of the first class is really the basic mathematically logically uh, problematic point of suffering in the world. If I'm essentially good, and Hashem is essentially just, but I'm suffering, something's got to give. Those pieces don't fit together into a, into a logical whole. And so Eov's conclusion now, and his theology seems to be shifting, he understands, again, as we said, the Mazalos, he's subject to the fate of the stars, and not, the, not really to Ashkocha Pratis which is the common view in the world. Uh, and that the mazalos are what controls a person's fate from the time he's born all the way till the time he dies. Um, we, we refer to this, and the world refers to this as a deist kind of a view. Aristotle embraced this and influenced the world to think this way. I think it's a common view one finds today. People do believe in the creator, not everybody, but those who do believe in a creator, but they believe that he's not actively involved in our lives. Chas v'shalom, because this is certainly not a Jewish view. And that we're I mean, sort of was... subject to the roller coasters of, uh, as we said before, the slings of our arrows of, of outrageous misfortune that, of, of fate. And uh, no obvious rhyme or reason to it all. It's a terrifying world to be in on, this, on, these, uh, on, on these terms. And, you see how people are terrified by their existence because who knows what's coming next and it's all kind of arbitrary anyway. The clockmaker's view, as it, as it were, as if there's a creator who just winds it up and lets it go, sort of indifferent. And um, Eov's now subscribing to this and as awful a perspective as it is, in an in a, un, un, unlikely way, it's also strangely comforting because if Hashem's not really involved, I'm not then totally accountable either. And then I'm actually kind of free to pity myself because, again, you know, Hashem created me. I'm happy for that. Thanks for that, Hashem. But all this other stuff is just simply grossly unfair. And what was me? Poor me. And I don't know if you read this also, but there's a, I mean, Eov in our third chapter now gets officially whiny. I don't know if you, I mean, you're, you're familiar with people who have this outlook in life. Uh, they're whiny. They're complainers. No? Right? They see, they see the world is out to get them. Right? And, and they see everything is distinctly unfair. As if somehow, again, if Hashem's not involved, they can't say, well, Hashem's out to get me. Because then if Hashem's out to get me, then evidently, kind of a catch-22, then he is involved in the world. Okay. So if that's not true, then they say things like, well, the fates are out to get me. They put it in some kind of non-distinct non kind of generic terms. Something's out to get me. Which, again, is sort of comforting because I'm a victim. And then I can be outraged and angry. A lot of anger out there in the world today. 
a lot of sense of uh, self-righteous, self-righteous uh, victimhood. The fact that Eov now, and we're going to see this a lot, will make many references to night and the day and the stars uh, encourages this reading. The Ramban draws on this, that the Eov will increasingly look at the heavens and say, you know, you Venus, you know, you did this to me today, didn't you? Kind of a thing. Right? And again, very convenient to blame the world, to blame the outer worlds for our own suffering. And he does, he suffers, and he's, 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 he's in sorrow. But, you know, it also does something, if you subscribe to this view, it does permit you, it does permit Eov to retain a basic level of the moon. I mean, again, he's never denying Hashem, and he's not cursing Hashem. Hashem is there, and Hashem is good. He's just not involved. Uh, this is a far break from where we met Eov at the end of this first chapter, just reminding you, he perceived Hashem, Hashem is both good. He's, he's, he's totally involved, Hashem, Natan Hashem Lakach. Right, Hashem gave, he gives, to, he takes away, and we don't question, we're all fine about that. Uh, when he gets to Shechin, that seems to break him, right? The personal suffering, the physical agony, uh, the religious ecstasy of the, of the beginning when he, that he ex expresses gives way to this feeling, I think we can characterize it as a weary submission. He's just resigning himself to, a, to, a, to a, quite a bitter fate. He suspects that maybe all those good times, all that success that he enjoys, maybe now was really all that inner fear was uh, maybe that he had earlier is this can't last. It's too good to be true. Remember at the very beginning, we described his reaction to his children's parties. He would bring Corbonos. He's at the emphasis, he has fear of heaven. There's a lurking feeling that Eov has something in him that feels. I don't deserve this. Maybe I'm guilty. Maybe Hashem one day is going to blast me. Well, if that's kind of lurking beneath the surface, now it's coming ringingly, painfully true. Uh, and maybe in a sense, he looks back and wonders, was I ever genuinely happy? Maybe all those good times, I was just faking it because you're supposed to have a good time. We're happy now, right? We're having a good time. Those are the desperate parties that one hears about, or when uh, Hasma Shalom, uh, you might, some of you might even experience, have experienced them on uh, party campuses where everybody's getting drunk and use it, using all kinds of um, self-destructive terminology, getting wasted and uh, and and such um, as as a mode of trying to pretend happiness in the face of uh, some kind of inner emptiness. And maybe that's what Eo's feeling right now. Uh, I'll point out too that Rashi, who's not going, doesn't go, Rashi's being Rashi. Rashi's giving the Pashu Pashat, explaining the Psukim as such. Uh, so he's not presenting an entire theological stance that he espouses. Um, but he understands here, and in this Pashu particularly, that there's a primordial cry of anguish and of fury, not in anything, not in Hashem per se. Uh, and that Rashi understands that this kind of attitude will lead to almost an irrational, disorganized rambling. Also words that I think some of us can identify with. Has anybody ever just been in such pain that they just scream out at nobody in particular? Or your kid's sister, because she's just right there. Yovad Yom Ivalid Bo is, uh, as we just read, let the day perish that I was born on the one hand, Yovad, let it go, let it be, let it go away, is not as strong as we saw in the previous verse, Arur, cursed is the day, uh, so that maybe he hasn't completely given up. I don't know if you know, there's another pretty famous Pasuk out there in a different Navi that says something very, very similar. You're meow. Yeah, great, right? But clearly, your meow is getting onto something totally different. I mean, your meow is a big tzaddik. What did Yaakov fill us in? I believe it was that your meow was born on Tishabab. That's right. So he says, "Go ahead." You said it you, you, was your, your insight. I I don't remember it. I, so right. that one, he but says, I remember. "Curse is the day I was born." Not like Eov is we're understanding here as, as somebody who's who's resigning himself to a bitter fate, but actually is a technical description. 
the day I was born happens to be a really cursed day, implying that maybe that's not a permanent state of affairs, and one day it'll be a great day of celebration, which indeed Chazal teach. One day, the, the day of our greatest sadness will revert in the end of days to be one of great celebration when we see how, uh, even though right now we're in the middle of the drama of, uh, of, of uh, you know, creation and history, uh, and a lot of it seems topsy-turvy without really a rhyme and a reason, sort of like Eov perceives, but in the end of days, it's all going to come together harmoniously and beautifully in ways that uh, we'll see connections, uh, sort of like, you know, you, 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 um, you, you read a drama where the, the author drops all kinds of hints all along, but you don't pick up on everything and you certainly don't get how it all fits together. And if it's done artfully, so it all comes together beautifully. Chazal described that's the experience that Am Yisrael experienced by the Yamsuf, uh, where their um, feeling of imminent disaster, Hashem has brought us to the desert, we've left, but now our taskmasters, the Egyptians are pursuing us and they're going to kill us. The sea is in front of us, we'll drown. What was this all for? Why did we experience all of this? And in just a very, very rapid succession of events, the sea opens, they cross through, the Egyptian army is destroyed, they get the plunder from the, from the, uh, from the sea, and there's such a sense of everything opening up, everything coming together, so miraculously and so harmoniously, like a discordant bunch of instruments, each one out of tune and, and, and not in sync with one another, uh, sort of as it sounds as they're tuning up before the orchestra starts playing. And then the maestro takes out his baton, as we say in the, in, in the beginning of many of the chapters of Tehillim, the conductor. Hashem is the conductor. And he takes out his baton and all the instruments start to come together and they play one gorgeous harmony. And your neshama lifts up as if you're hearing a fine concerto. And you start to realize, I see now how it all comes together. There really is a master plan. And there is a shlach pratis. It's just I'm small and I didn't get it. Okay. No brainer. That's what we subscribe to. That's the view. That's the classic view. Eov is not there. And it's to his detriment. Nebuch. You almost want to scream out to him, Eov, it's okay, buddy. You'll, 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 you'll get through this. Gamze Yavor, this will pass. This will, you'll, you'll, you'll see better times and you'll understand how it all fits together. But right now, curse be my birthday. I understand that, the, that Hashem creates the world. I understand that maybe even there's some kind of greater meaning in it all. But um, here, Eov is entirely passive. He's cursing his fate. He's implying that uh, maybe there's a general Ashkacha, but not a particular Ashkacha. And um, his words now are starting to be indefensible. His attitude is one of uh, a nihilistic attitude and um, implied, in, implied kfira, uh, if not outright kfira, if not outright um, heresy. Um, next week, Bezrashim on Sunday night, we'll resume. We'll start talking about um, Eob's experience. And then we'll back up and try to reflect in general. What do we understand? What is an Isayon? What a Chazal teach us about the concept of Nisayon, of a test. Um, and of course, in defining Nisayon, we'll also come hopefully closer to dealing with it when we have them in our own lives, inevitably. Um, questions or thoughts? Just a quick question. I might not be following perfectly, that's why I might have this question. But like, is the reason that we, we look at at like Eov like as being some he was like afraid he was gonna get like stricken down he was like he had that that guilty conscious or whatever you want to call it yeah like, great great yeah i've been playing up on that a lot yeah no is that possibly a reason of why he could have been stricken down because he was so fearful of it it's like a lack of a moon kind of thing i don't know oh it's such like... a great observation shama i think you're onto something for sure okay you know this idea you would it reminds me of what you're saying and it's a very profound idea we're all supposed to work on our bitachon Bitachon is not just faith in Hashem, but the understanding that really everything is for purpose. Everything is good. Everything is, yeah. You know. And it's good. So then, of right. course, what do you do with the notion of Ishtadlus? What is our role in this world? If, every, if Hashem runs the whole scene, a kol bidei shemaim, chutz meira shemaim, everything's in Hashem's hands except for fear of Hashem. Well, I'll just sit back in lotus position and just sit fear of Hashem all day long. What do I have to get a job? 
Shem provides all the money. Right, right. right? I would have to do anything. Yeah. Right. So the age-old question that t- takes more time that we have to, de- to develop here, one of the approaches is how much yishtad does you have to put in? Well, Chazal say, it sort of depends on your bitachon. Right. If you're a person of immense bitachon, Rav Yosef, Zayn, uh, Rav Yosef Chaim Zunnenfeld comes to my mind. He was somebody like that, a uh, person of deep, genuine faith. Nobody ever saw him lift a finger to make a living. And he made it. He got through it a long life and a meaningful life. Not an easy one. Lost a lot of children. But uh, if you're not on that level of faith, don't fool yourself and think you are. You're right. going to have to do more ishtadlis. You have to work a little harder. So, and a similar, uh, that's what I'm hearing when you, when you, with, with your great idea now, Shammai, this, um, this idea that, you know, maybe, you know, if you're not quite holding, <clears throat> you're not quite holding where you claim to be. And in, in fact, you're pretending to be this big, you're a Shammai, Ishtam, right? Asur uh, Meirah, all these, all these uh, virtues, but in fact, it's a bit of a sham because inside you're plagued by doubt. Well, then maybe all this is, going to come true and your doubts will it will will um, emerge as a as a personal uh, point of, of of suffering we're reading this in um i should say though and i, I think i not maybe i've been directing you in this direction this is not the common view of eo most of the mafarshim understand that he's essentially virtuous good guy and there's nowhere explicit that um that says not in the text at least that says that he deserves any of this Right. So less we less we assume. Well, that's a given. Um, most people, most of the mafarshi, most of the commentaries do not assume that any of this is a given. And indeed, part of the whole struggle, our, our, our attempt to try to come to terms with Eo and what happens to him is, well, then how do we account for this? If he's essentially innocent, and even right. if he's maybe he's got even some some flaws, but not these kind of flaws. He, does, he doesn't deserve this. I feel like we're trying to make him seem like he's not innocent because that'll make us feel better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Excellent. You know, sure. Well, I mean, you know, we, right. you might even think that we're like Eo's, Eo's friends, trying to comfort ourselves. Because, of course, that's what happens. Precisely that insight. You know, if he's kind of got it coming to him, you know, it's the immediate um, reaction drivers feel when they see the accident. You know, you tisk yourself and you say, you know, he was speeding. Right, right. Coming to him. Not going to happen to me. I'm okay. Right. Scary. Yeah, great, great comments. Good. Okay, um, have a wonderful Shabbos. Again, anybody who's want, who wants to, we have a really nice session at 4 o'clock uh, Eretz Israel time. That means you have to be up 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We do like a pre-Shabbos schmooze. Uh, I, do, I do something on Parsha, usually something brief and uh, overview. And uh, then we go into Shabbos with a little Kedusha. I started it, and I realized I should have been doing it for years. It's such a nice thing. It's such a nice bonding thing with the shear. But it also, um, I started it when they were quarantined and didn't really have access to anybody. So uh, it became our, our set. Min, I'd love to see if you, if you want to join us tomorrow. Same same uh, bat time, same bat channel. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, great to see you all. Hey, you're all right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.